Welcome to Directly Correct, a PLS podcast with Cole Scott. Today's guest, Vin Vashista, AI advisor at B Squared and author from Data to Profit. Thanks to our sponsors, One Model. One Model helps people leaders at large organizations make consistently brilliant talent decisions by unlocking the analytical value of the data dispersed across your business. One Model's people analytics platform takes all of the heavy lifting out of data extraction, cleansing, modeling, analytics, and reporting of enterprise workforce data. One Model pioneered people data orchestration and has perfected the ethical use of AI and data science for leaders who need transparent and explainable decision support systems. HR and business teams trust its accurate reports, analyses, and storytelling capabilities. Data scientists, engineers, and people analytics professionals love the combination of governance and flexibility that no other Workforce Insights platform can provide. To learn more, book a demo at onemodel.co slash directionally correct. All opinions are our own and do not reflect those of any other organization. Well, how big do you think a company needs to be before they hire an HR person? What do you think? We've talked about this like early on. Um, I don't remember. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's been fucking two and a half years. Yeah. Um, like, uh, clearly, it's not going to be like the second person, right? Like, it's, it's yeah. not going to be the third person. It, it's got to be at the point where the owner or whomever can't handle comp anymore. So I'm, I'm guessing... 50 i mean i would even argue that like a lot of small companies the finance person handles comp in the beginning or just hiring managers handle comp yeah you know so even then you know there's not it's not necessarily a necessity i think my rule i don't remember what i said in the past but i i think my rule is when the first time you have like a lawsuit scare <laughs> right or some kind yeah. of like really just negative thing that happens that an HR person would have you know, presumably helped pre prevent. I bet you that's when it happens. And that could be 50 people, 500 people, what have you. Just event based. I mean, like, I, I think that's how most companies start. Like we, we hire based on need, not because, because like yeah. we have X number of folks. What's up, Vin? Hey, how's it going? Nice to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you too. When do you think a company should hire their first HR person, Ben? God, as late as possible. I mean, <laughs> just because you know, more HR, more more problems. And it's not necessarily that HR causes problems. It's that the reason why you need HR is because you have talent problems, regulatory problems, you know, compliance. It's it's if you can put it off, do it because there's a lot of overhead to it. As soon as you have your first one, all of a sudden it just sort of balloons. Yeah. Well, what, what's that event? Is it, uh, you know, sexual harassment in the office or, you know, no, like... I don't, I don't think you want to wait until something like that happens. <laughs> I mean, that's, <laughs> uh, no, I, I think it's, like I said, it's really regulatory. I think a lot of companies you can, in the U.S. at least, you can go all the way up to 25 without doing any sort of HR and without falling under most of, I mean, you, you need somebody who can do the accounting, the payroll, the, you know, so that AR function, Yeah. but you don't have a real HR function quite yet. And with your first 25 hires, I've seen this with a lot of startups in my own company, like, I am picking these people personally and so whatever culture i'm bringing to the table obviously they're going to mirror and as long as i'm not a tool they i don't have to worry about that stuff with them but as you start scaling other people take over hiring and that's when things get a little spooky <laughs> i'm really glad we we started on this because i, I kind of wanted to set the tone with vin's not an hr guy <laughs> No, <laughs> Vin, Vin is very much. <laughs> he, he's a data guy. He's an AI guy. He's a founder. He's a tech guy. You know, a lot of different things. And so, I thought that would be a fantastic way of, you know, kind of starting the discussion. But it's kind of kind of like how like Michael Scott hates Toby, right? Like he's like you can't stand that dude. <laughs> can't stand him. I think necessary Absolutely. evil is <laughs> is truly how I view. HR as a function, because you're right, you have people who you need to manage out. And there's a process mm -hmm. to do that properly. You have people that you need to train and upskill. So there's a process to handle that. You have people who are, you know, especially in engineering, 
uh, a little bit inappropriate. You need to handle those people and give them constraints so that if they wander outside of them, you can manage them out. And for a lot of these people who are coming out of the startup world, this is the first time they're seeing, oh, oh, like there are rules to how I should act around people. And so that's a necessary function. But after that, I just a lot of the things that come next feel like creating work for people who don't truly have enough work to do. Mm. Yeah. Well, Vin, I, one of the things that I love in an individual is somebody who's willing to have a hot take or take a contrarian point of view on things. And I think we cover that type of stuff often on this podcast. And I remember coming across you from a mutual colleague, uh, Sonali Kumar, who sent me yep. your direction at one point in, I remember seeing this post, and this, this is probably a little while ago now, where you, you said, my most unpopular hot take, and I'm like, I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it said, data teams that don't create revenue will be gone in two years. The future of data and AI teams is customer-facing products. And there, there's a whole long slew of, of reasoning you have behind this, but yep. I, wanted, I wanted to talk about that with you today. What, what made you say something like that? And, and, and let's talk about it. Well, that's the reality. I don't think you can escape it. That's really where I'm coming from is, and you're seeing this now in survey after survey after survey. We had for really a decade, sort of this mess around mentality where there weren't a whole lot of, uh, weren't a whole lot of results expected. It was experimental and the ROI that we delivered was kind of like, a, oh, wow, I didn't know this would happen. So that's great. Now we have different expectations, especially about two years ago. As soon as attention turns on to a technology, expectations follow. Mm -hmm. So now there is C-level really attention to generative AI. And with C-level attention, you have C-level expectations for outcomes. When they talk to shareholders about a generative AI strategy and generative AI revenue, you're on the hook. There's no way to avoid that. You are now on the hook for delivering results, delivering outcomes. Data teams didn't realize that. And that was the biggest challenge is that data teams didn't realize they had just gone from, you know, really, if we produce anything, it's gravy to we've promised shareholders revenue and improving margins increasing free cash flow if you don't deliver my neck you know as a ceo my neck's on the line so your job is now also equally connected to my fate and data teams did not realize that now we're seeing cdos if they can't quantify their value they're getting tucked in under somebody else they're no longer c-level leaders they're just sort of mid-level executives suddenly. And you're also seeing companies who can differentiate, who can deliver machine learning features, who can deliver generative AI features. They are outperforming by leaps and bounds. So there's this unevenness to the marketplace and, and companies who don't have a high performing from a revenue standpoint, data team are looking at everybody else's data team and saying, I want that. Why can't you deliver that? So I think it's just pragmatism. I mean, I'm kind of interested in your takes. What what are you seeing? Are you seeing the same thing? Are, are data teams being held more accountable? Well, I, 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 yes, yes, they are. Because like like you said, CEOs are really excited about this technology. The C-Suite like, really wants to like include Gen AI into everything. But I think about like our internal data teams and like sort of external data teams as well. It's easy for an external team to create a product. You know, you go out, you, you have users interface with it, but those internal teams, how do they show value? I think that's a real struggle for a lot of organizations, right? Like, how do you build, you, you're building databases and all this sort of stuff that, you know, other groups consume, but how do you put a dollar value on that? Well, the thing I would say <clears throat> is I don't think that it mattered until like 2022. And I think you read some of those articles I posted, Van, about, the last 15 years of people analytics teams. And it was just the teams got bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more people were doing it. And then it crescendoed in 2022. And then those teams started to get cut. And I think it was almost a 10% reduction <clears throat> in the field overall in the United States. 
And I think that was due to the them not producing value uh, for the organizations. And I think we're actually about to be back on the upswing again, thank goodness. But it's and it's taken a mass set of education. I would actually take a little bit of credit for that with this podcast and the newsletter and everything, in in being voices of reason in that space. But I think that's probably a pretty good transition to your book from data to profit. Tell it tell us about that and 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 how does that relate to what we're talking about here in regards to you know data teams and being relevant and driving value for organizations. Well, I think there's a misunderstanding on two sides, and it's the reason why I wrote the book. On the C-level side, they think data strategy, AI strategy is a data team thing. It's a technology thing. And that's absolutely not the case. You have to change your culture. You can't use data until you do. Why? Because if you're wrong, that's a bad thing. You can get fired for being wrong. But data that keeps telling you you're awesome doesn't change anything. And so it doesn't deliver any value. <laughs> if you want people to use data, they can't be punished for being wrong because the most valuable data, guess what, tells us what we're doing wrong. It's the data that gives us insights. It provides new knowledge. So instead of I don't know and therefore I'm not an expert, we have to change the way that we look at data and say, oh, that's a new insight and it's an opportunity to improve. It's not, I was making the wrong decision in the past. It is, I found new information. And now that we have this data, we have this model, we can do things better. It's an opportunity to improve. That's one side of the equation is we have strategic debt and we have cultural debt that we have to address. And it's not just that scenario, it's dozens of them. So that's one side, just the C-level leadership needs to realize there's a ton of money, there's a ton of opportunity, but there's also a ton of work. On the other side, technology teams need to know that there are roles they don't have. We're asking people who are primarily technologists to figure out strategy, and you can't fake that. I mean, you, you try to do that without some training, without some upskilling, without some new capabilities, and you're in a serious amount of trouble because you can't. C-level leaders get into this pro into this themselves. I mean, it's not just the, the IC level. You see this in CDOs, CAIOs, where they are considered you know, C-level in, in name alone. They're tacticians. And so they don't have a seat at the strategy planning table until you develop this construct of technical strategy, where you have both sides of the house represented in one person, someone who's strategic and who understands the technology well enough to say, these are the opportunities that are feasible. These are things that we can build. So you need AI strategists, you need product strategists and product managers. You can't just tell your data team, hey, you figure it out. That's never worked. That has worked absolutely mm -hmm. zero times. You can't ask them to do something in 10 seconds. That has also never worked. It's it's not like you press a button and everything's cool. The cheap path, good triangle, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, you're good, right? You just bought some technology, you waved your hands, and it's awesome. And no, it's not. And it's never worked. And if we don't change things, it never will work. I'm going to go a random direction here and ask you, what is your favorite X-Men character? Because I think I know which one it is. Gambit. Oh, dang it. Nope. I was going to say Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. You very much have a Hugh Jackman as Wolverine <laughs> vibe. And you got the baritone voice. You got it all going on, Vin. And I was like, this no. guy is, is Wolverine for sure. All about <clears> the Gambit. <throat> that, that's, that is my jam. Yeah, he, love him. Sad he hasn't had it, gotten a movie. Hope John Cena, you know, if we could plug that, get John Cena back as uh, Gambit, that'd be awesome. Yep. Want to see that again? Or not John Cena. Who was, uh, it was, um, uh, no, it wasn't John Cena. It was the other guy. John Cena would be cool as Gambit. You're <laughs> right. I mean, well, yeah. I, I think he's already got a different persona. So maybe we want to go a different sure. direction with Gambit. Yeah. What was his name? He was in the last Deadpool movie. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not oh, good well. with actor names. Yeah. I mean, obviously me neither. <laughs> Well, what, what sort of like you say, like we need the combination of both uh, highly technical folks as well as like yeah. a AI leader. What sort of skills go into that? We're like quickly approaching an area where Gen AI can take over a lot of the sort of the coding yeah. and sort of like highly technical tasks. And I think people are gonna have to like collaborate a lot more. So like what kind of skills 
do we need for the next generation of particularly gen ai sort of leaders in the field i think you have to learn how to lead that's something that we haven't taught people how to do very well yeah we, we don't teach technical ic's to be leaders we just promote them yeah and this is what we do with every role that's not technical if you wanted to go from java developer to doing rust or doing c plus plus you'd you'd get training you know, literally you would go to probably six months worth of training back and forth before they let you touch the code, but they just promote you to leader. And you truly, you just get a manager's promotion and you're good. It's like, <laughs> you're good. Go get it. It's the same thing with product. PMs are coming out of data science teams where they just look at a data scientist and go, you want to be a product manager? And they say, yeah, why not? And it's like, all right, congratulations. You're the king of the uh, data engineers here. Go for it. Yeah. You own it. Congratulations. <laughs> and there's no upskilling at all. So when you say, what's the, what is the first thing that we need leaders to do? It's, it really starts earlier where we need to number one, explain why leaders deliver value. What is it that a leader does? What is a manager, director, VP, yeah. C-level? What do they do that delivers value to a technology team? Not to some, you know, sort of genericized, but People in IC roles have to say, oh, now I know I have a manager. That, that has to be a construct where they say quality leadership is important because, and they talk about things that are valuable to them, things like removing barriers, access to resources, providing me opportunities, giving me a career path, career development, helping me to grow as not just a technical employee, but as someone who knows how to create value and as someone who's going towards working on projects I'm passionate about that I'll enjoy so that this is not a soul sucking thing. Someone who pushes back when I need them to and gets me sort of this realistic picture of what I can deliver. And then the same thing with PMs. We need to define what a product manager does. We need to define the value in, of an AI strategist. And we need to explain to technical ICs Here's why you need one of these. And if we do that, we'll have more people coming into the role because they're passionate about what it really is. Not because, you know, I, I had nothing yeah. else. They'd predict, you know, I was a senior staff and the only thing they let me do was a director or a VP and I've never had leadership training. So, well, so, so essentially the same things that make someone successful as a leader anywhere else in the organization, right? Just basic. I think it's different. No, it's different for technical. It okay. really is. We deliver value differently. Go, go on. In what ways? Yeah, yeah. Tell us more. Well, no, I mean, it's a lot of removing barriers. A lot of what technical ICs struggle with is that they can't get their ideas moved up. Yeah. They can't get buy in. They can't get. And I mean, you're hearing product roles, strategy roles, leadership roles. We do something very different. The business understands sales. Why? Everyone sort of gets it from HR to marketing to, you know, obviously in sales itself, but the entire business knows why they have sales. They know why they have marketing. They know why they, I mean, each one of these other teams is pretty well understood. We know what they do. Technology. No, no one has any idea what this stuff works, like. right. mean, how it works, where it works, if it works. I mean, just no one knows us as well as they understand other organizations. So our job as leaders, especially at the C level, is a lot of education. So we have to explain leadership in a different way, but we have to talk about it in terms of what does it do for an IC? And it does a lot of different things. You know, when a salesperson says, I, I, I need this tool so that I can close more deals, it, you know, a CFO is like, yeah, no worries. Got it. Okay. Close more deals. No right. problem. You know, I know why you are asking and I can figure out if we have the budget for it. But if I say I need to, you know, I need this data, data engineering tool or I need mesh or I need, you know, so our data is in better shape. They're like, what? It, so it's a different <laughs> thing. Really, really different thing. Is it just like harder to experiment or is it like it, it's so much more costly? Let me ask you this. You said, let me sort of turn the question back around on you. If I said we needed to buy, uh, you know, Neo4j because we need to build out knowledge graphs that'll support our AI better than any other data structure, especially as we get more mature, it'll handle things like rag. Do you know how much to spend and why you're spending it? And do you get the mm. sense that anyone else knows right. what yeah. to spend or how much they should spend on it? 
you know, are you spending, you know, 10 times too much, 10 times too little or just right? How, how would you know that? Yeah, those are really, really sophisticated questions. And what's the back end? What are you going to get out of it? Yep, yeah. Yep. And you exactly. see as a technical I see, that's the way I look at it because that's yeah. my need. And if you don't have a translation layer there, if you don't have a strategist, if you don't have a leader, if you don't have a product manager, all three of those are necessary because you have to explain these things at three different levels. What is it going to do for my team? That's your leader. What is it going to do for all of our products? Really touching revenue. That's your product strategy. And what is it going to do top level for the business? How does this roll up and make an impact on uh, top level strategic goals? And that's your strategist. If you don't have all three, I mean, what are you going to do? Have an IC figure this stuff out? <laughs> they, they don't know. I'll, I'll give you a formative moment in my life. Uh, I was working for essentially a sales organization. I was just a really junior sort of IO at the time. And uh, the sales guy called me over and he had this Excel sheet. And he was like trying to figure out how to like essentially just add numbers together. So I made just a little like some formula. And he was asking something else. I went to go like change it. He's like, no, 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 don't, don't change it. Don't change it. This is like perfect. Don't, don't, don't even. He, he was so frightened that any sort of thing, just like the formula is going to be changed. <laughs> he had like a new little calculator tool. He was so proud of it. Terror. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, but that, that just goes to talk about the little technical knowledge that people have. I mean, please don't undo the magic that you just did. He was like, yeah. seriously, just like a thumb across three columns or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. One, one thing that I'm proud of, Ben, is I think we probably have the most technical audience out there in the people analytics space. And what I wanted to do is just to, to show that you're not just a data guy who's doing work in the AI space more generally, but you've actually had some experience in the people and in people analytics use cases and HR technology use cases. Can you tell us something, some about those things? So that our audience, you know, they're like, ah, we like this guy, you know, tell us a little <laughs> bit more. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone in the HR space is ever going to truly like me. <laughs> because I ask, you know, I ask some tough things from them and say sure. some hard truths about how the rest of the world sees the HR function. But it's because I've been there. You know, I've been in sort of the trenches building technology for you. And you have every right to hold us to the same level of accountability. And I think that's where I want to start off my experience in the HR analytics space is we've let you down too. It's not like, you know, this is a one way deal. HR analytics has been a lot of letdown. Our accuracy on prescriptive mm -hmm. insights, not great. I mean, really the history of this is bad because we overpromise, under deliver. And this is something that I've seen for close to a decade now working in people analytics. We've told you that we're going to be able to screen resumes and we still can't. I mean, AI still doesn't do that very well. It could, if we designed it better, it could. And I've worked on resume screening. I worked on recruiting and hiring workflow software. And I've seen just the entire field over promises and under delivers because it does stuff like uh, ranking on title. So if you're looking for a data scientist, it'll just look for everybody with a, the title data scientist and it'll say, well, obviously this person should be at the top because they're a data scientist today. But if you look at titles, they're actually one of the worst indicators of competence and capabilities yeah. because we over title and under title people all the time. So this is something that we have to work on as a field, which is delivering solutions for HR analytics problems and sticking around, not just saying, hey, we solved the problem and then book, mm -hmm. we have to stick around and figure out, does this actually drive outcomes? And that's the other thing we don't do a lot with HR. And it's something that I've worked with them to figure out. HR can't define its ROI very well. And this has been a problem forever where they're asked, what's your ROI? They don't have a good number to put out there. You know, a lot of it is we save you from getting sued. I mean, that is a yeah. lot of the ROI is we prevent you from getting sued and we make sure that you're compliant, but that's not a very compelling argument, which is why a lot of the time they're the focus of job cuts and, and layoffs, but I've helped HR teams figure out how to communicate their, their ROI by showing them that their outcomes touch every part of the business. They do hiring. 
guess what everyone who's in the business today went through? Oh yeah, the hiring process. They touch everyone. Why compensation? They touch everyone. Why? Because almost everyone takes a vacation. They, every single thing they do touches everyone in the business. They have some of the highest ROI in the entire company, but they can't prove it. However, if you use data, you can track these longer chains of value creation. And now you can start to show because we changed a few things in our hiring process. Here's how much less time each one of these teams is now spending on these, these interviews and reviewing resume, you know, the hiring process. Here's how much adding one day to the onboarding has reduced in time to value for that employee. I mean, you can do some things to explain, look, some of our ROI is ridiculous, but you have to have the data and you have to make those connections. Yeah, it was like Spotify put uh, in their meetings, uh, a dollar figure associated with how much the meeting was cost based on everybody's salary. Imagine doing the same thing with process improvements and the hiring process. I I love that. Exactly. Mindset. These efficiency plays don't seem to like resonate very well sometimes, right? Like they, with the the assumption that people would be actually being, you know, productive during those times that they weren't in a meeting, what have you. But I I don't know any other way to really show it from an HR perspective, just the same way as like I use Gen AI, you know, it's a massive time saver, right? It allows me to do other things. Yeah. And I, I mean, you can show that if I, this is how much HR processes cost, especially yeah. hiring. And so it's not a, we're saving hours. No, this is how much one hire costs us. Here's recruiting costs. Here's sourcing. Here is the amount of time it takes for a phone screen. Here's the amount of time it takes for, and you can calculate how much one hire costs. And if you can bring the cost of hiring down, you're not talking about efficiency. You're talking about the cost of getting someone in that chair, but you can also quantify loss. If someone puts in their two week notice, that chair is empty every day for two weeks. And the value that person would have been creating is lost. So the faster you can hire, get somebody in that chair and contributing at the same level, the less loss Mm -hmm. is incurred. You can quantify these things in a totally different way when you model the workflow and then track it to outcomes that aren't these fuzzy productivity Mm -hmm. things. We have to quantify it in terms of business value, which means you have to quantify things up front baseline and then start moving forward with your models helping you get better i wonder why hr doesn't do this right is it just because not trained trained to think that way well i'll tell you this scott i mean i I feel like i'm in a very minority camp here because i I brought this up over and over and over again everybody tells me how impractical it is is employee lifetime value Right. I think that's essentially what Vin is describing on the front end, the hiring side and on the, the you know, the, the the attrition side of the equation. But essentially, customer lifetime value is something that's commonly calculated mm-hmm. in sales and marketing functions. And you have the ability to do the same thing in HR for employees and companies, frankly, just choose not to. And it can be an incredibly powerful way of quantifying the value that HR is bringing, but also the productivity of employees, even though we know that that can be a fraught thing to measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it's really the reason why, yeah, the the reason why HR companies or HR teams aren't seeing it is they haven't hired me yet. I mean, just bring me in. It's really simple. Bring in V squared. We'll take (laughs) it from here. (laughs) Nice plug there. Huh? What plug? No, no, no. I was answering the question. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, let me um, let me let's pivot a little bit. And one of the things that you, you told us you wanted to talk about, Vin, was some of the job losses due to AI and potentially even in the HR space. And and just where are we in the AI hype cycle? Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I, and I mean, this is something I want to hear a little bit more from you, from people that are from your audience, from your viewership. Is as in as a field, we need to come to terms with the fact that we are automating people out of jobs. We can't keep pretending that's just this, no, it'll never happen. 
So really interested to hear your takes on what are you seeing? I mean, obviously, like I alluded to in my last answer, we're, we're seeing some losses. We're seeing HR as a target for downsizing. AI is looked at in terms of how many HR people can we replace with AI? And I mean, first, is it time to admit that it's impacting jobs? Has this hit or is this still coming? Well, that, that's why I put the hype cycle part of this in. If AI could do everything that the companies are marketing it as the, the ability to do, yeah, we would be having way more job losses. But a lot of the things out there are just kind of this vaporware type of stuff that have been shipped. And so I, I would say we're at risk over the next few years. Um, and, and just kind of go full circle to a point you made earlier about HR being really started as when you get into the compliance space. I think it's some of the compliance-based tasks that are most prone to being automated by mm -hmm. AI. And so if we don't transition to a value creation function, like we've talked about a lot in this conversation, and, and we just stick to, well, you need us because the laws say you need us. Well, they don't say they need you. They say that we need compliance. And if you can get that compliance via some AI or some software, you know, what, what really is the risk? And so that, that would be my perspective on it. I mean, I've seen it here and there. I would say it's mostly in the very, very, very transactional functions, but I, I don't think we've seen this in mass like I would have expected by now. Yeah, I, I think that we've, I think everyone got excited about Gen AI, it, you know, popped off about two years ago, then like, you know, about a year ago, it seemed to like really peak. But I think people are realizing now it's not as easy as just going to, a, you know, computer terminal and plugging some information in and like, you know, getting, you know, the best recommendation for a candidate out or, you know, what have you. So I think some of that's cooled off a bit, but I think we're, it, the technology is going to grow over time, right? So like, it's going to get better and better. So it's going to be a gradual push, not necessarily uh an instantaneous sort of transformation so i think we've like cooled off a little bit on that well, what, what do you think then i think i'm a little more worried than you are because i see what's in the pipeline as far as products well what's in the pipeline tell us you know i agree <laughs> that what's out there today there's a lot of disappointment i mean that's really where yeah. we started yeah. is as a field we have let you down considerably well freak us out freak us out yeah, tell us what's coming. If you answer questions for the majority of your day, mm -hmm. all of that work's gone. I mean, tr yep. not some of it, all of it's gone. If yep. you spend most of your days on approval workflows, mm. all of that work oh, is gone. God. I'd be so happy if that went away. <laughs> I mean, no, like this isn't all yeah. terrible, but you have to realize how many people are underutilized. And I think yeah. that's the thing is that it's not that, that you can't do more work, but if you look at what you do on a regular basis, and if you see that very, very little, you know, sort of 10% of that time is spent on these things that AI can't automate and 90%, like I said, you know, the approval workflows, mm -hmm. responding to emails and informational requests, looking things up, building documentation, updating documents, none of that stuff will, you're not going to be doing any of that in a year. So if that's 90% of your job, even if you could, even if you have skills that could be very valuable and are not replaced by AI, your role can be, and it's not, this is what I think we're missing is it's not how capable people are, it's what capabilities businesses are using people for. It sounds like that like lower middle management layer is kind of what you're describing, what I'm hearing anyway. And a lot of the transactional work that I was talking yeah. about. You know. Yeah. A lot of payroll stuff's going away. A lot of that Q&A about, you know, why did my raise not go through or I don't see mm -hmm. vacation time or, you know, not enough yeah. hours or all of that type of work that used to funnel through payroll or, you know, that yeah. HR payroll sort of overlap won't happen anymore. It's going straight into a chat agent. Is it bad that everything you described, I would be happy to see be automated? Wait. No, I think we're automating the right stuff. Yeah. 
Like that was that was the hope. I mean, I remember talking about this, you know, the month that ChatGPT came out. I was like, oh, thank goodness. Now we'll be able to finally automate some of this stuff. We've been talking about automating for 15 or 20 years and we won't have to do it anymore. I'm like, do I never have to create documentation again? Yes. Thank goodness. Do I not have to go through senseless bureaucratic approvals? Yes. You know, like all of these things. And again, I, I understand your point taken about it's not the person, it's the role. And some roles are just predominantly that's their job. But perhaps it would be better if those people were reapplied to doing things where their work was actually more valuable. But they won't. Yeah, There's maybe. the challenge. The 10% of the role, obviously, that's going to double yeah. because we're not doing enough of that type of thing. We're not spending enough time talking to candidates. We're not spending enough time creating more efficient processes and focusing on using models, using analytics and figuring out how we can do this better. We don't have time for continuous improvement. We don't have time for transformation. And so that 10% that you've always wanted to make bigger, yes, it'll double. You'll be able to spend twice as much, sometimes three times as much in order to fulfill all of this work that you really have wanted to do. But even if you triple that 10%, that means that you only need one third. Yeah, that's only 30%. Yeah. Sure. And there's your, that's the problem is that when you take all of that work away and yes, you're going to be able to do a lot more and the company really wants HR to be doing two or three times what it's doing. And it wants HR to be doing these more complex optimization, efficiency, high value but still that is only going to be maybe tripling the amount of time that's spent on it now. And that significantly drops the number of people. If you have a 10 person organization, once you fully implement AI, that's three. And what's really underestimated is that it's not just one business. Like you're not going to be able to, you know, it's this business and these few businesses, but There'll be tons of other industries that aren't, you know, that where this won't be happening. And so there'll be plenty of jobs. It's, you'll see really domains sort of funnel in over the next five years where you see a 10% reduction this year, 20% reduction the next year, 10% reduction the next year. And over each one of those years, and just think about it, if there were 10% fewer openings, if there were... 10% more increase in layoffs. It, you, it sounds like a really small number until you look at where we are today and then take 10% away or add 10%. And all of a sudden you realize that's a lot more people looking for fewer jobs. Mm -hmm. This is going to happen faster than we expect. What does a guy like you do for fun, man? <laughs> I scare people on podcasts. Yeah. I mean, truly, this is my hobby. That's, that's, this is my works. pleasure. <laughs> when you ask the you ask the X Men's you know question, it's like, ah, oh, you should ask me about the villains. I got two or three of those. I model my life after. Uh, <laughs> I'm ashamed to say I don't know who Gambit is. I'm, I'm not a big uh, Marvel it's okay. card guy. Yeah, it's okay. The car playing cards. Playing card. Yeah, like, like explode. You throw dude. stuff that blows up. I mean, who yeah. doesn't want to be able to turn anything you touch into something that blows up? What guy doesn't have, you know, that <laughs> four-year-old fantasy deep down inside where it's like, wait, anything I touch blows up? Cool. I can blast a hole through that wall. Let's do this. <laughs> I know what I'm doing this weekend. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> well, I'll make one last point on, on kind of what you were saying before. Yeah. Um, I think HR people, and I saw this more bold face when I was in the startup world. You don't hear it as much when you're in big corporations, but I think the same sentiment persists. I don't think HR people realize how much business people resent how many HR people they have to hire in terms of, yeah. because they don't necessarily feel like HR is producing the value. And so they're not particularly going to be that sad if, unless you're working at a, a truly progressive value adding function to see, you know, 10% go year after year, right? Yep. And in that smaller pie that you're describing. Um, I think, again, to go kind of full circle here from your, your book, From Data to Profit, that's why it's incumbent for HR to transform to be a value add function. It's just, yep. it's so important because, again, if somebody's not sad to see you go, that's not a good position to be in in mm. a time of transformation and change. That's totally right. Yeah. 
You nailed it. Well, thank you. Um, I I don't empathize with the villains in, in X Men. I do like <laughs> the other characters. I'll just say that out loud. Um, but Scott, do we have a, a confusion matrix segment today? Yes, we do. The confusion matrix. Real quick, we wanted to say thanks again to One Model, the AI and people analytics pioneer for sponsoring the episode. And now back to the confusion matrix. Hit us with a villain. Who's your favorite villain before we get into it? Ooh, favorite villain across. I mean, Thanos, Galacticus. There, there's some good ones from. <laughs> Yeah, we can we could do this work. all day. Yeah, I could yeah. I could definitely do this all day from X Men. I mean, Apocalypse, obviously, that's an easy one. <laughs> I'm starting to be like, why did we invite this guy? <laughs> like, what's I'm just a ray of sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, okay, so uh, Cole told me that you'd be down for experimental. We're going to get fucking experimental yep. today. Okay, so early in the week, Salesforce announces going five days a week. Uh, a large retail website also announced that they're going five days a week as well. So <laughs> people are coming back to the office. People are coming back to the office. So I love the way you put game? that. What's up? I love the way you put that. <laughs> <laughs> Who shall remain <rename> anonymous? <laughs> this is called stoked or bummed. These are yeah. relatable things in the office, and uh, I, like I could say, like people cooking, you know, food in the microwave in the kitchen. And you may not be there for that smell, but you may love the aftermath. You want to see the world burn, right? You can be stoked just to watch people's reactions. All right. Random shit. Okay. This isn't well thought out. Stoked or bummed? Chair thieves. People that swap your chair just randomly. That's a real thing? Oh, like yeah. In engineering, that, that's a cardinal sin. You touch somebody's <laughs> chair, that's like, that's a, that's a ruler slap offense. Yeah, so no, bummed. Yeah, no. Bummed. I, Oh, you see, some people feel like they're community chairs and it's everyone's chair. Why is it your chair? But uh, I'm, I'm very much in the bummed camp as well. I, I, I sit next to a, a, a deep technical team and uh, one of them has their monitor like shifted you know, uh, vertical, yep. you yep. know, and yep. so it's 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 open seating. But everyone has their own freaking seat. You know, like we all mm -hmm. sit in the same spot and some interloper came in. This lady just and she starts like changing the monitor. I was like, you're messing with this guy's space, man. Anyway. Whew. Uh, okay. See somebody lose their mind. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Melt down in the workplace. Get your video cameras out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, truly. Yep. I think we'll see a resurgence of office wife slash husband. Bummed. That's horrible. I don't know what that is, but that sounds terrible. <laughs> so, like, uh, two people that marrying are marrying somebody from the work. No, 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 no. Not, not, not married. Uh -uh. Not married. Nope. They're just nope. <laughs> <laughs> i think we're talking about you know some people say oh this is my work wife and it's yeah. like your friend at the office i think it's kind of uh cringy it if is. not worse but yeah i mean i think that's what he's talking about seeing seeing from yeah. afar like two people you're like jesus christ just fuck already i mean come on <clears throat> let's get it going hard hard pass <laughs> very bummed I, th I think you'll dig this one. Uh, we've we've all been away. You know, we've lived in our own little uh, bubbles. We're coming back. We're gonna see the return of the office nemesis. Ooh, I feel like uh, you're using the office I'm, example. So you got Jim and Pam, and now you got Dwight Schrute. You know, like I'm, I'm <laughs> someone who in the office. You can't you can't learn from somebody who agrees with you all the time. So you need somebody who will challenge you. So I'm I'm stoked on that one. Yeah. I'm not talking about someone that challenges you. I'm talking about just someone you hate for, I don't know, for reasons. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, you need some people like that in your life. I mean, everybody needs somebody who challenges them on a regular basis because that's how you learn and grow. Yes. I mean, no, nobody loves it, but yeah, no, I'm stoked. Yep. yep need more nemesis. You punch you every day. Really? <laughs> yep. Need more of that. <laughs> Early in my career, I worked for some pretty sociopathic people. And at the time, I really, really hated it. I learned a lot about how to navigate those situations in the workplace. And it has served me so well since then. So I think I think you're on to something, Ben. <laughs> yeah, you need to learn how to because uh, guess what? One of the top CEO traits is uh, just a little bit of sociopathy. Oh, yeah. Um, true uh how about this uh how about these assholes the uh conference room squatter just someone that just like books a fucking conference room all day 
I don't. What are you doing? Bombed. <laughs> uh, just, Bombed. Yeah, you need that much space for what? I mean, what are you doing with that much space? Oh yeah, like they, they don't even use it like half the time. Yeah, I don't, you know it's funny. I'm at the sea level now, and I'm sort of going back a long time because I haven't worked in the corporate world forever. I'm going back a long way in my memory and going, oh yeah, that yeah that used to be terrible. That's still <laughs> happening. It was in my head. I'm thinking we haven't fixed this yet. Yeah. I had the same feeling. So I was, I was in corporate environment, went to startups for a few years, went back to corporate environment. And it's like, I never left. I was like, Oh, all this stuff's Nothing still changed. going on. Yeah. And it's the same everywhere. I mean, these, these are ubiquitous sort of things, right? Uh, how about this? Uh, we haven't seen this in a long time in office birthdays, you know, cut up the cake. Everyone kind of standing okay, in the cake, kitchen. Cake looking forward to. Yeah. Yeah. I buy the cake. I don't buy like the, the, you know, the forced camaraderie, the mandatory yeah, fun. The, so the cheesy. Yeah. So definitely if HR is bringing my team a cake and just kind of dropping it off and going, Hey, happy birthday. <laughs> and everybody gets an email that says, Hey, it's this guy's birthday that I'm good with. But if it's, you know, mandatory 10 minute break. Oh no. Especially developers. We oh no, no, no. Don't put another break in our day. No, 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 no. no. Don't break my coding flow. There's a there's a team uh, somewhere below me, some uh, floor below me, but they they cook uh, like cinnamon sugar waffles like every Thursday, and it is divine it sounds, smelling. That's amazing. Yeah, that sounds delightful. It is wonderful. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's see, we got a couple more here. Uh, thermostat battles, you know. Ugh. What? Yeah, this is. Sorry, I'm remembering. That's a thing. Yes, that's horrible. Not looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'm guilty of this being someone that has their computer volume on, i.e. like, um, my, my computer dings all day. Every time I get a message. Yeah. Engineering world. That's a, that, that is another like two slap penalty that, that will yeah. get you fired at some point. <laughs> Ding. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And quick. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that yeah. will stop fast. <laughs> I remember in a, in a, in a previous company, uh, I'd never heard the iPhone like that, just bell, like bing. And I kept yep. hearing it from across the room. I had no idea what it was. And I, I thought it was like Pavlov's dog. Like, what the hell? Like, I couldn't time it up to anything, but it just turns out it's my friend's phone. Just randomly messages. Yeah. Okay, uh, last one. Uh, the badge of shame, i.e. someone forgot their badge at home and it has to wear you know, the temporary badge for the day. I guess security. I mean, you know, especially in big cities, but really, really yeah. in a smaller town or, or someplace that's kind of in the middle of nowhere and, you know, really? Well, I'll tell oh, you, here, here's the worst feeling is you're halfway into the office and you realize you left your badge at home. Oh yeah. It's like, Oh my God, I got to turn around or I have to go spend, you know, 15 minutes at security to get a visitor one and say, and like, and especially if you're in a hurry, it's like, oh, this is the worst. We used to always so, just leave our badges in the office. Like we would leave our badge <laughs> in our in office. office. <laughs> so the first thing in the morning, you're like, oh, sorry, I forgot my badge in my office again. And, you know, security would just kind of wave you through and you're good for the rest of the day. And then just when you left, you left it in the office. Wow. Genius, man. Efficiency That's play a... right there. ROI. Optimization. We do it. <laughs> That's definitely something you should mention on a podcast. <laughs> Oh uh, gosh. All right. That, that, that's stoked or bombed. Stoked or bombed. There All we right. Go. That was a fun one. That was that was a good yeah, experience. That was good. That was really good. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll keep it going. Let's um let's do some nerdery. The nerdery. I'm, I'm gonna pull up one. I thought th I thought you would like this one in particular, Scott. Um we got some researchers from Stanford. Uh, have published some research that kind of settles a debate that we had a while ago. Well, not really a debate, just a question that we had, which is, can LLMs, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, generate novel research ideas, a large scale study? And essentially they had three research conditions, a human, an AI, and an AI re-rank. I'm not really sure what the AI re-rank was, but essentially across things like novelty, excitement, feasibility, effectiveness, and overall, AIs were consi uh, consistently ranked except on feasibility 
as outperforming humans in terms of the novelty of the ideas that they put into play. So essentially human beings can are still more feasible, but it's really not. I mean, it was, I think it was within the confidence interval, even it, it's still pretty close. Um, but right now, uh, overall AIs are, are, are able to generate more novel ideas than, than human beings. I thought this was a, a fascinating thing because we were kind of of the mind at least a while back that, we weren't sure that AIs could actually generate things that human beings hadn't come up with before, but this is lending at least some evidence to that claim. I'm not saying it's necessarily that they're, you know, generating a new hypothesis in physics that no yeah. human being has ever thought of before, but perhaps that's possible. Yeah, I what think, do you guys at think scale, at scale, that's what you really want to think about is this is happening at scale. So if I can come up with eight ideas and evaluate to figure out what the best of those eight ideas are, and I get into a group of peers and three of us work together, we come up with maybe 15, 20 ideas and we can evaluate which one of the best, you know, the best of those with a generative model, it can come up with 25 million yeah. ideas and use other models to evaluate which are the best ones and deliver the top 10 out of 25 million. So it's not that they're generating something that's novel. It's that they're able to generate and evaluate so many more, so much faster that what they deliver is a more comprehensive review. So it's not, you know, it's not a better or worse thing. If a person could process that kind of thing, you know, that volume of ideas or generate that volume of ideas and, you know, and weed through them all, we would be just as effective, but we don't have, you know, we don't operate in computational times. Mm -hmm. So it, we have learned instead of throwing out every idea that's in our head, like, you know, you're taught that's childish. Whereas with an LLM, you're taught that's a good thing. You've got all these evaluator models. It'll take them 30 seconds to evaluate 25 million ideas. And so you just go, yeah, here they are. That's a really good point uh, because you can't just come up with like tons of ideas. Some of them will hit like humans yeah. are not exempt from coming up with bad ideas by any means. Right. Uh, but th this is the nature of innovation. It's combined, combining two different things. Right. And it's generally li limited to like what a human would know, like th their breadth of experience. But now you have um, Chad GBT, well, whatever, Gen AI that can scour all of Google Scholar know everything about every field what's already taken place combine those ideas in a uh, comprehensive way and like Vin is talking about you know evaluate them on the fly there's no way humans can compete with that right like i i, I cannot keep up with the io field at all yeah ai can when i just i i just worry about the day when AI can be a bad podcast host better than us. And then, <laughs> then we're really, then we're really in trouble. But I think what you were saying, Scott, was actually a pretty good segue into your article about the impact of chat GPT on human skills. You want to talk about that? Yeah, abs absolutely. And I was actually debating whether, uh, which one of these would go first, but I think this works out right. So the impact of chat GPT on human skills, a quantitative study, uh, so significant interest in amount in uh, ChatGPT and like what sort of skills it can impact. Um, but there's not really quantitative data on the subject. So what the researchers did is they collected 600,000 tweets about ChatGPT and how it's been used. Uh, then they ran NLP on it and identified uh, ChatGPT affects 185 different skills across STEM and humanity sort of fields with mostly positive reviews, but some concerns about performance limitations. Uh, any ideas of what the main skills uh, that people are using it for? Any guesses? Didn't read it. Don't know. <laughs> well, I read, I read through it. Yeah, but I'm not going to spoil the lead. Go for it. <laughs> Number one, programming. Programming, no shocker there. Uh, yep. There's other things like storylines, writing songs uh editing scripts and uh you won't believe it but creating new concepts it's also a big skill used there so pretty pretty cool like that there's been some questions about how chat gp is being used and here you go actually i'll be curious what you think about this vin because i before two days ago i had a hypothesis i've i've, I've changed it somewhat because of something i'll mention in a second but 
I, I'm, I've been thinking for a while that the AIs themselves tend, there's, it tends to be this eerie correlation to what they're best at as to what programmers use. <laughs> and, and so it's like, well, if programmers are creating AI and the things that it's best at are helping program, it's like, huh, <laughs> what's circular. going on here? Yeah, it's a big circle. <laughs> And so I, I, it kind of led me to the conclusion before that it's like, well, if you're not doing something programming related, like if you're a plumber, it's probably not coming for your job anytime soon because the people who are creating it don't care, give a shit about plumbing, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> but then um, I, I saw this uh, social media post from a, a guy who works at OpenAI and he said, you know, there's a reason why a lot of the products that are shipped with AI are so bad. And it's essentially, it's because we're not trying to ship products with AI. We're trying to build AGI and we're shipping the products just to get money from investors mm -hmm. and to make sure that we have any kind of positive cash flow. But the real goal is AGI. So that's why everything is so bad. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense too. But I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Scotty, did you say that you were one of the researchers on that paper? No. no. Oh, okay. I thought it was, I was like, Wow. That's cool. Um, but I also didn't want to say this if you were. I mean, the research methodology on that was questionable. <laughs> the, the, there's a question of like, what would people say? Like, they're collecting data on tweets. And like, you're not going to tweet if, if it didn't work, right? Well, no. I mean, think about what half of everything on social media is built by. AI. Half of those tweets, and I mean, this has been researched. Half of those tweets oh, that they like so bots. bots, yeah, those are all bots. I mean, half of those tweets are synthetic and generated, and so there isn't a person actually doing that work, it's just pulling from a press release and shipping that out and saying, you know, we did this and it was awesome, or this company did this and it was awesome. But if you look at the research methodology that was used, it's like, I don't know that any of this stuff was actually valid. There's the challenge is that there's so much garbage that every time we do research studies, the only ones that are valid are the ones that are getting into the workplace, talking to people and then measuring productivity outcomes. You know, here's the baseline. Here's what happened after we implemented. And those have such small sample sizes because we're just now getting to more general adoption that a lot of these research studies, those early sample sizes were mm -hmm. small. A lot of them were enthusiasm because they weren't measuring true outcomes. They didn't look at a baseline. They just said, well, how much more productive do you think your guys are and your team is? And they're like, I don't know, like 35%. I don't know. I mean, truly these surveys are written for people that are throwing numbers out, but they don't have true data behind them. The surveys that do, I mean, GitHub's done a lot of really good work, GitLab's sort of a similar idea, but there's companies now that are doing significant measurements of what they're getting value from and what they're not. And it's what's being found is that these are generally useful, but you have to learn some things up front. We need to change the way that we architect and design AI products so they fit into the workflow. We need to stop over promising because a lot of the stuff we say it does, it doesn't do very well. And so there's a lot of factors coming into play, but we're we're at that inflection point now where we're delivering and we're starting to see real, you know, large enough sample size, mm -hmm. true impacts. And it's across the board. I mean, it's not just people building for developers. It's a lot of different types of creative tasks. Like Midjourney is a great example where, yeah, developers, model develop, you know, the, the engineering side kind of built this, but the community picked it up and said, okay, here's what we needed to do. Here's what we needed to do. Yeah. We needed to work like this. It would be better if it did this. Hey, I tried this. It didn't work. And you began to see the community really building it in line with the engineering side. Well, can I, can I ask a follow up here? And this, this yeah. is somewhat of a technical question. Cause like as, as a, a relative lay person that I am, I think I, I understand a lot of how this AI works in, in principle. There's one thing that, makes no sense to me. And and it kind of gets to your point about the the tweets and the bots from earlier is synthetic data used to tr to train models. How can non-real data be helpful to train models to do real things? I I do not understand this. Can you can you help me with this because 
people are like, well, even if you don't get access to certain pieces of data, we'll just create synthetic data. And that's going to help us to understand it from a, you know, an evaluation training and inference. And I was like, that makes no sense. Can you help help, help out here? Yeah, the, the way synthetic data works is if you think about what generates data, and this is something we don't do enough. We don't think about data sets in terms of what is the thing that generates it. And in a lot of cases, it's people doing stuff. If you're tweeting, that generates data. If you're, you know, HR workflows, think about anything that you're doing. If you're answering questions, that generates data. If you're hiring, if you're screening resumes, that generates data. So the data that's generated, I mean, you think about it as a bell curve. The way that you do a task 80% of the time is now 80% of your data set. And you have these tails where we don't have a lot of data on those, but we know that they are, you know, they're tasks that we need to train the model to be able to handle or else it's only going to be able to do, you know, sort yeah. of a limited set of workflows and a limited set of variety. So you can take some of those categories that are on the tails and begin to say, okay, here's, you know, here is the data. I want the LLM to look at this data and create a lot more data that looks exactly like it. And then that helps the model learn those tails, but you have to have enough data to build the synthetic data set. And what does that mean? You have to have enough of those tails. You can't just create something full stop out of nothing. Yeah, yeah no, you, know? you have to have like, something there to base it on. It's like classic yeah. bootstrapping. Sounds like yeah, that. it's like Monte Carlo simulations yeah. and things like that. It sounds like kind of, yeah, kind of, yeah. Uh, synthetic data being put into uh, to train models, i.e., just create noisy data. And can the Gen AI, Gen AI still pick out the right, you know, sentence structure and this sort of stuff as well? It depends on the noise. That's always the thing that we have to say is what noise really means is that we have features we shouldn't or we're missing features. Mm -hmm. So noise is really features we shouldn't have or examples of the workflow that are invalid. And you get that a lot of the time where people try to yeah. do something stupid and, and, you know, just watch people use products. You realize that a whole lot of that data, you don't want anyone learning from because <laughs> th that person is an idiot. So you don't want the, you don't want your AI learning from idiots. I, it just, that's a, that's something that we <laughs> fundamentally don't talk about enough is a lot of this data, especially online, social media, a lot of that mm -hmm. data, you don't really want a model learning from, you know, when somebody's pitching a multi-level marketing scheme <laughs> as legitimate business opportunity, you don't want a model that talks about business learning from that data. <laughs> you might, if you're creating AI agents to deal with customer service, then <laughs> they need to know their, their audience. <laughs> <laughs> then you need to, yeah. yeah. Know your target audience. Yeah. Every Tinder account has like a female CEO of a company. It's like, oh, they're all multi-level <laughs> marketing. <laughs> you see that so right. often now you really yeah. do mlms have just oh my goodness they've permeated the psyche of people that are just bored i mean it's not just women it's yeah. truly anyone that's at home and bored uh, mlms are just so appealing because now i'm not bored and it sounds like i'm doing something productive it's like we, we used to just like call it what it was like a you know pyramid scheme like no yeah. no you got to rebrand it yeah yeah that's what it is. I mean, crypto. I mean, sorry, I didn't say that out loud, did I? I didn't actually say crypto. That didn't, that didn't come out of my Bitcoin. That didn't. I didn't say that, did I? I didn't say Bitcoin. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is this is so fun. <laughs> well, you want to do one more? Yeah, let's let's do one more. It's actually kind of along these lines. Do you want to talk to us about the Babel effect? Uh, yeah. Stuff? So testing the Babel hypothesis. So speaking time predicts leader emergence. Uh, so leader emergence is highly correlated with uh, time spent talking in groups. Uh, but others have rejected this, uh, saying that uh, both quality and quantity matter. Uh, namely, Bass, nineteen ninety, in our pre meeting, Colts went off on this dude, called him an asshole. He really hates Bass, nineteen ninety. <laughs> Uh, so this leads to the need to uh, yeah. control for it. No, you, you don't even know who the hell Bass is. Uh, uh, what are you talking about? <laughs> just fucking with you. Okay. 
So there's a need to account for these sort of things. So what they did is they took uh, 33 student groups, uh, ranging from four to 10 participants, uh, and they gave them a problem to solve. Uh, the 10 minute planning session, 60 minutes uh, to actually do it in a computer simulation. So they're doing like a, I think it was a military task and uh, something else. Uh, but the results, speaking time relates to different uh, direct effects of leader emergence after accounting for intelligence, personality, and gender. Uh, so it does appear that just speaking in groups does relate to becoming a leader, at least in a small study. Yeah. Promoting you to management is the only way to get you to shut up in the meetings that matter. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not wrong. I mean, I do refute my hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. I think it's saying if you, if you talk all the time, you're going to be in management. <laughs> That's really what no. Saying. You're going to be promoted to the point where I don't have to deal with you anymore. That that's truly what yeah. happens is no one wants you there anymore in these technical yeah. meetings because all you do is take them over. They call it falling up, right? The, the other sort of scary stat from this is 19 out of the 33 groups had someone with zero talking time. <laughs> so, granted, like we're talking about student groups and this sort of stuff, but well over half, no talking whatsoever. Just someone just set there you know what's funny is I, I look at a lot of this research well that's probably a lot i don't look at a lot of this research but i hear people talking about it and <laughs> it's you'll hear you know there's research on the Babel effect side and then there's always counter research on you know why introverts are actually the best leaders oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's like these are two sides to the same coin here and they're just, it's like you know people are just talking past one another i don't know i find that stuff to be funny I mean, there's introverted and there's like, can't function. Right? Yeah, there's, there's two sides to this. I mean, getting promoted is one thing, but being a quality leader is a different metric. So mm -hmm. there's, when you do study design, this is really one of the core components of design review is what are you measuring and does that correlate with what you're representing in your results? And the fact that you get promoted to leadership doesn't necessarily indicate that you are a quality leader. Here, here. Totes. Yep. Well, this is this has been fun, Vin. Thank you so much for joining us today. I feel like we had a, a really cool discussion. It was depressing at times. <laughs> but we figured out you want to be a supervillain, but that's okay. We're okay with that. Uh, Scott, any parting word for Vin before we give him the final word? Vin, this has been fantastic. Uh, how can folks reach out to you if they want to get in contact? Uh, Datascience.vin or on LinkedIn. Um, you can Google me as well, but if you put in Vin, Vin Diesel has better SEO, so you have to actually start spelling my last name. So I'd advise, you know, just go to the website. <laughs> yeah. Unless you want to watch Fast and the Furious or something like that. Not a bad right. movie, I hear. Maybe the, the new Gambit, Vin Diesel. <laughs> it could be Vin Diesel, yeah. I don't think that would work for her. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think Gambit has hair. Yeah, Gambit has hair and he's French, not Italian. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've been listening to Directionally Correct, the People and Links podcast with Colin Scott and today's guest, Vin Vashista. Thanks for joining us, Vin. Thanks for the time. Thanks for having me. Directionally Correct is dedicated to you, our listeners, to help educate and entertain you on how to effectively do people analytics. By supporting this podcast, you're helping us continue to provide valuable insights and knowledge to our listeners. Please consider becoming a patron of the podcast. You can find the link to sign up in the show notes or at patron.podbean.com slash directionally correct. Thanks for your support.